finish my sermon with this question. Where are you sending others? Because where and why and how you are sending others out into life matters, especially as someone who sees themselves as a follower of Christ. What tools are we equipping one another to have in a world that is full of tough situations? And what do we need most to train our children and ourselves? This actually goes a lot with some of the discussion we just had with Harvey. We don't all need to pick up right now and go. There may come a time for that. But we do all need to know how to connect in, how to prepare, how to gather the right supplies to really be able to help the others in the world who need us. And today's scripture is obviously very short. It is one of the many wisdom sayings provided by the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is a collection of sayings that was gathered together by all of these wise sages. The sages were the social class in the sixth century before the current era that served as counselors. The sages were bureaucrats and teachers. And they were the ones, as the Hebrew people were divided into two kingdoms, the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel. And so they were the ones that people looked to for their wisdom. Like our counselors, our leaders, and our educators today, the sages were constantly trying to study God in relationship with our human nature. The sages saw themselves as teachers trying to hand down the wisdom that had been gathered from the past to the students and the people of the future. And next week, we will continue to try to find the tools and the trainings and the ways to pass down and reboot what it means for our children to be in worship with us. Now what we are doing in this place is very different than what is done in um, most of the country. There are only other few churches who continue to have children worship and wonder in the actual worship space. And already you may have noticed that over the summer there are a few changes. You may have noticed that the work material has moved into the back room. We now have many of the stories that were donated to us, so the children will actually be able to wonder and work with those <laughs> stories once they've heard them during wondering time. But these changes primarily involve the children. There are two changes, however, that involve you. You, the wise sages, chosen to help train up our children, our youth, and our young adults in the ways that will lead them towards God. So today you will see that Rob handed you guidelines. Those guidelines are actually really helpful when talking to children about what is happening over in this space in worship. This area up front has been set aside as a place for the children to wonder and talk with God. And it is seen as a sacred place. But it is a sacred place that doesn't just welcome the children, it actually is able to welcome all people. And I want to invite you, in all seriousness, at some points to leave your pew and get up if you want to and go work over in that area. Studies have shown that multi-sensory experiences of God are really actually very good for all ages. <laughs> that most people aren't verbal, that most of you by now have zoned out and are listening to your own sermon in your head, that the world is actually filled with people who are visual and tactile and need a lot of different ways to be able to engage in their prayer life and their worship life with God. And so you are welcome at any point as adults to remind yourself that there are many ways to talk to God and to be with God and to hear and experience the stories of God. I do not judge your doodles for those of you who are writing on your church bulletins. And so I want to remind you not to judge the kids' work. And to remind yourself that if a child, like they're doing right now, shares with you something, that what they are choosing to share with you came from a sacred place. <laughs> so often we say, kids, oh, that's good. So then all of a sudden they try to strive for what is good, and what is an accomplishment versus what may be what they need. 
So we are trained not to judge what is good or what is bad, but to change the questions a little bit. If someone has engaged with you at any age, something that they have worked on and put their heart into, instead of saying it is good, maybe you can ask questions. If you would like, will you tell me about what you drew? That question doesn't have any judgment. That question just means I'm interested, and I'm glad that you're willing to share with me. Olivia Stewart, the granddaughter of the woman who put all of this program together and is now the director, shares a story of her childhood. She'll tell you that as she did her work each week, she would draw a house every week. She would go, she would grab paper, she would grab a crayon, and she would draw a house. It did not matter what the story was about, she would sit down and draw her house. And one of the adults finally said something to her in a way that seemed to say that it's great that you're drawing a house, but maybe there's another way for you to engage and talk and worship with God. That what she was doing wasn't really on task. Olivia, however, will tell you that she knew that what she needed to say to God each week was that she yearned for a healthy and happy home. Home was her prayer every week. And she needed to share it with God every week. You see, children worship and wonder believes that all children already have a sacred relationship with God. That our role is not to judge it, but to find ways to let them have the space and the time that they need to be with God. And the same actually is said for all of us. I believe that all of us have a special and sacred relationship with God. And that in our busy world, all of us need to find ways to have the space and time that we truly need to be present with God. And just like we show the children the best ways to kind of do this during orientation, we must as adults remind each other the best ways to be in relationship with God. And I get it. In theory, that sounds great, right? Oh yeah, we all want to be in relationship with God. We got this. We're going to go meditate and feel the deep moments of our soul and listen to extra things that we need. But in practice, it's not until your phone completely dies that you realize it's really hard to be still. To know. To allow God to be really present. It's hard to recognize that sometimes our children are probably more connected to God than us. And sometimes they're not. It is not a good idea for pastors to use their children as sermon examples. Right, Amy? And as they get older, those pastor's kids know and kind of start to feel embarrassed by what their parents share about them from the pulpit. And I'm telling you this because I'm totally cheating on this this week. Because let's talk about last week, shall we? When my children shared their best selves during worship, without any of my guidance or help. I mean... If you were paying close attention, we had a talking toy during our wonderful silent prayer. And we had tons of tears at the end. You can see our hope and sometimes our reality. When it's others people, children who are breaking down, I am actually really okay with their meltdowns. I welcome them as a challenge. For all of us to really live into what it means to welcoming children and ourselves and everyone in our beautiful and not so beautiful moments. I celebrate the fact that hopefully at some point many of us feel like we would be able to break down in worship and just be our real authentic selves in a place without judgment. As a mother in this pulpit, 
I hear the judgment. When it is my children, mom mode begins. And it is amused, embarrassed, annoyed, and completely stressed out. It panics over everyone's comments at home and, and wonders if this whole children and worship thing is just really a terrible idea, no matter how many conventions and conferences I've been to. It, I start to doubt. The whole thing just starts to doubt as the tears start to flow. I hear those parents and their pushback of going, well, this is my time. Not my children's time. This is my time to worship. And I'm like, oh, this is my time to work. And no, Jesus and God, people, you're not helping. And I think of those words where Jesus said, let them come. And I go, really? Really, can't we just let them come later? <laughs> Proverbs actually reminds me, though, that we really are called as adults who are children of God and as children who are children of God, to train one another up. And I must remind myself that many of those embarrassed preachers' kids actually still have higher statistics to be in church. Well, we are doing something a bit different here with our Children Worship and Wonder program by having it present for all ages. I've seen it live in churches successfully for over 30 years. The children getting baptized in my California congregation had to pick a favorite Bible story to share as part of their baptism journey. We had a large group, you know those years every once in a while they come and you're like, whoa, they're like a million kids. We had that big year group and none of them picked the same story. And none of them picked the stereotypical kid stories either. They knew enough stories to find the one that really worked with their faith at the moment. And they even knew how to share it openly with their faith community that loved them. And so I continue to remind myself that the scripture that continues to feed my soul and my call to ministry as we all come together is, Do you love me? Feed my lambs. So I come even when it's not easy to feed my own lambs. I come to you begging, begging for your help to feed the lambs. Two of them are mine, but ultimately they're ours. And I need all of us to help train them, feed them, and love them, even in their meltdown moments. And in that, let me and my husband and others know that you're going to love us too, even when we melt down over our children's meltdowns and over the tough moments and terrible things and the stigmas that hold us back in our lives. Because there is a moment where every week and every year and every journey, they're going to be sent out into the world. And they're not just sent by me, they're going to be sent by us. And it is an us that needs to guide them. And so we ask that question, where are we sending them? Are we sending them away in a way that doesn't connect them? Or are we sending them connected to our love and the love that we show them of God that will be able to be carried with them wherever they go? Oh, wise sages, I need your help sending all of our children out with your wisdom each week. So this is where the second thing is shifting. One of the elements that did not make it when we transferred it from the room to here was the closing blessing. The children at the end when they're in a different room get to go up with one of the adults and the adults give them a blessing. They either say something nice about them or if they can't think of anything nice to say that day, they say, go, God go with you, and go in peace. And we name them in that moment. We make sure to say Tyke or Michaela or Madison. And we look at them and we say, God go with you. Go in peace. And while it may sound simple to tell a child that God goes with them and to go in peace, it's actually really hard, I've discovered, even in my own ministry, to look someone in the eye 
and remind them that God loves them and that God's peace goes with them. And so we are going to practice. You, right now, are going to be asked, and you're going to giggle, and it's going to feel awkward, because it's hard. It is hard to look at somebody in the eye and say, God, go with you. Go in peace. And if you can name that person, and if you don't remember that person's name, just ask. Say, you know what? My memory is lacking. Just tell me your name. So I want you to take time to look at someone around you. And I'm also going to have some of these children come out to you as well so that you can practice with the real thing. But at the end, as we continue, when I come up here for the benediction and we're into this orientation in a few weeks, I'm going to send the children out. And I'm going to ask them to come to one of you and you get to name them and you get to know that you are sending them out. So let's practice. Everybody stand. Find someone close by. If you can't stand, find somebody who needs you. Anna Jane and Ty, come here. You have to find someone you don't know. Can you go find Miss Susan? Here, you can go. the greatest force of all. 